Welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. Welcome to a special edition of Pit Lane Parlay. My name is host Mike Jokum. Joining me today is Shay Holbrook. Uh, Shay, how you doing? I'm super, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, you know, thank you for you know very much for for joining this afternoon. Uh, you know, for those who aren't aware, uh, we will uh, you know be talking to Shay today about everything from the W series to maybe some random things and. Uh, maybe some IndyCar. So we'll uh, we'll dive right into it. The WC's, W Series season, you know, just ended now. What a couple of weeks ago, I think. Um, it was kind of a different weekend than most race series. It was pretty condensed. Each weekend, you had a different car and a different engineer. What was that like? Yeah. So it's it's really quite unique in that it is in the form of a spec series um with the caveat of in order to keep it uh truly focused around the driver and less uh engineering um a, a championship um the w series is really unique in that you know they took 18 of some of the best female um, drivers in the world um globally in a six weekend uh, championship where we would drive the F3 FIA Tata chassis, um, whereas all cars are identical. Um, so we the only ta- the only difference is that every ra- every race weekend the driver was kind of like the limiting factor. So the driver would be rotated from different chassis per race, and as well as the chassis, the the engineer and the mechanic would follow that chassis. So for example, chassis. 46 is with you know Mike and John and that team stays together throughout the season whereas the driver is you know is what is the 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 limiting factor there of um, what switches in and out so that's what makes it um, really quite cool because it gives you the opportunity for if you have great success um, to capitalize on that and then if you have maybe not so great of a weekend let's say maybe you have some kind of mechanical you know, maybe there's, you know, something going on with the car, you have the ability to come back from that. So you got to kind of, you know, of course, like motorsports is so unique in that there's so much you can control, like in the cockpit, out of the cockpit. And then there's a huge variation of what you really can't control. Yeah. And then on top of that, and then on top of that, there's luck that plays into this whole game. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I watched, I think every other race, and I mean, you're, you're definitely right on the luck, you know, that first first lap of the first race of the season I forget who it was hit the one driver as she kind of overshot the corner and your uh your your race is over really before it gets gets started um right so you know 2019 W series is now over uh how do you compare that driving I know you've driven a couple F3 races this year as well uh what would be the main differences in you know driving style obviously tracks are, are are different because the w series was was only over in, in europe this year but uh what were the main differences between the two now that your 2019 season is is coming to a close so i think the main difference is that the chassis and the engine packages are different from f3 americas um with the honda cha- or the honda motor and the Lige chassis and then in the w series we run with an Alfa Romeo setup um, in a in a Tadis chassis, um, but what makes them both identical is that they're uh, spec to FIA F3. Um, the American car is actually a little bit quicker than the European car. What we're just to differentiate here, um, and then because the chassis are different in a lot of ways, I can't explain to you actually how different the cars do feel. Like the American car feels very freed up. Um, you also have the ability though in you know F3 America to make any and every adjustment to the setup to you know benefit the driver um, because all of that, that is all open to you and your team and your engineers. Whereas in the W series, it's a structured platform where we have very limited adjustability to the car. So typically we could only change like front wing 
um, ride height depending, and then rear bar settings. So we have a very, very limited um, adjustability in, in the W series uh, setup. So I think because of those two, that's why I would say that they feel so different. Um, I think they're both really good platforms and I'm super, you know, thrilled and happy that I was able to get F3 America races in prior to the W series, uh, launching because it was my first year racing and driving single seater. So it was a really big, um, you know, uh, hurdle to, to tackle. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I definitely liked what I see. It saw in, uh, one last, uh, W series question before I kind of move on to you know, plenty of the other list of accomplishments you have. Uh, the W Series had its, you know, fair share of detractors this year and, and people who kind of were, were naysayers about it. And, uh, you know, everybody had their own opinion. What would you say to the people who kind of weren't big fans of it because of the fact it was just women racing and, and all the other, you know, kind of crazy things they said? Well, I got to say, you know, in the beginning, it was totally fine to have th those opinions and viewpoints because we were, you know, they were, um, <clears throat> you know, really actually bringing into effect for the first time ever successfully something like this that is, you know, pretty much uncharted territory, unchar uncharted waters. And, you know, I think a lot of people, yeah, they were hesitant in how this, you know, this is going to be played from the, the female aspect and whether this is going to be a positive or, or negative for women in the industry moving forward. And, and I even had my reservations, you know, I wanted to sure. make sure that, you know, my brand and who I am and what I've been about um, for the past, you know, 10, 11 years, you know, matches up with this because, you know, it's one thing, like if you go to, if, if you m make a decision um, that really goes against what you've said that you stand for, for, you know, the entirety of your career, <laughs> and and you jump on that bandwagon then there's really no returning and um as i continued for me personally as i continued to understand more about the w series i got on the phone i i made the effort to ask not even actually ask questions because i didn't even know what to ask i just got on the phone with them to understand more and they answered by telling me a lot of the questions that I didn't even know that I had at the time. <laughs> um, I said, I just was like, this is really, this would be really stupid for me in particular, because I do not have a full season budget to go and do, you know, whatever type of motorsport, you know, I'd like. Um, this would be really dumb for me not to at least, you know, dip my toe in, like, see if I can play, you know, in this arena and, um, and give it my best and, and it's an opportunity. So I, towards the end of the season, I think a lot of people, especially the naysayers, started to maybe recant a little bit or just quiet down what they were saying. And I, and I think that ultimately came from how flipping amazing the competition was and how high caliber this series had been ran and throughout the season and to be alongside a DTM platform in Europe is massive. Um, and I think too, as like the story started to come out about a lot of these drivers, like some drivers, you know, we, we know their names and other drivers were, you know, the dark horses that nobody knew that, you know, ended up doing, you know, fairly well to obviously to, to make this, you know, limited grid um, to earn a seat, a free seat, right? A funded for seat. Um, I think that's where the naysayers kind of started to just, you know, quiet up a little bit because the racing, I mean, you just can't deny that the racing is some of the best that we've seen and it's just even cooler that it's a bunch of women and um i certainly think it's it's positive for women um i think the the initiative and the motive and everything that stands behind the w series is awesome and um at the end of the day you know what it's really good for motorsport as a whole like if we can put more eyeballs on our industry um more viewership it turns on you know, the potential of more investors and sponsors coming into our, you know, our industry. And, um, and, you know, there's, you know, it's, it's really kind of ridiculous that, you know, young, young girls need to be able to see that there are female racing drivers. And if so, they were turned on to it because of what the W series is accomplishing, then that's an accomplishment in itself. You know, just the ability to have access to this and um, that this can be a career, you know, whether you're a driver or an engineer or working in, you know, media even, you know, it's just, it's a really, this, like this industry has been so, you know, near and dear to me and has shaped me in so many ways, 
you know, exterior of being in the car. I mean, I just couldn't imagine my life without, you know, being a race car driver um, and what it's given me, like the, the, the amazing benefits that this industry has given me. I love it. That's a great answer. I think we found our YouTube clip of the week right there to, to, uh, <laughs> to help promote that one. Um, real quick, I had, I had one question uh, that kind of, you know, when you, when you were saying that popped up in my head, you know, before the W Series season started, there was obviously the lengthy uh, selection process. What was the selection process like? I imagine it probably being more stressful than most people realize. Oh my God, you hit the nail on the head. It was unbelievably <laughs> stressful. Like I do not talk about the selection process as this like this amazing thing. It was brutal. It was emotionally draining. It was physically draining. Um, and the reason being is because it started in Melk, Austria, where 60 drivers went out and we a week before, you know, had um, like a schedule, if you will, of the types of um, driving events that we'd be doing, marketing events that we'd be doing, um, team building, you know, exercises, et cetera, and, and the, the definitions of what those are. And um, what made it so difficult is, A, there were 60 drivers. Um, B, you, you didn't know how you were being evaluated. There was no pass or fail the moment you accomplished your quote-unquote mission. Um, so, you it, it really toyed with your emotions because you're trying to navigate like whether you're doing something that is received you know positively or negatively and um it yeah it, it just it toys with you um it was pretty brutal um you know luckily i was in the you know the the, the, the smaller percentage of actually getting through um and then moving on to the actual s3 test that we did in almeria spain um, you know, that suddenly became a little bit less stressful in that, you know, we became more comfortable in our environment, right? Like being in the car, being at the track, racing against the clock, being able to analyze not just your data, but everybody else's data, like working with your engineers, like the things that like the things that like we thrive on and, and being able to see like your self progress, that was definitely more fun. Um, but then again, for me, <laughs> the, the last day, um, I was the last driver um, announced to to join, you know, the the, the grid of 18. Um, and that I feel like was somebody was going to get like the shit out of the stick there. And that was me. And it didn't mean that it, I was just, you know, last or not. That's not at all what it meant. It just meant that I just so happened to be called last. And at that point, you know, I was really kind of feeling defeated because I knew where I stood in the ranks of the test and I knew it wasn't last. Um, so I was starting to feel like there was something that obviously I didn't do to make these, you know, these people happy. Um, and when they called my name, it was like a massive, massive relief. <laughs> I feel like it's probably one of those things where you're in grade school and you're like the last person picked for dodgeball or trying yeah, out. It, more. it was, um, yeah, that's exactly what it felt <laughs> like. I mean, it was her, it was a horrendous feeling, but you know, you know, this, like this whole thing, right? I mean, there's winners and there's losers. And, and just because you lost once doesn't mean that you're going to lose again. And I think what's so important moving forward is like everybody that had tried out for this, that, you know, really actually was, you know, quite good and, you know, has massive potential. Like I definitely advise everybody to continue to stay involved, to continue like, you know, going down this path of trying to earn, you know, your spot in the W series, because you will, you will gain so much additional knowledge. I mean, I think I learned more in eight months than I have probably in two or three years wow. in the cockpit engineering wise. And then also even about myself, like I grew so much in, in eight months of, and, and it was hard for me because, you know, I didn't come from, so I, I definitely had an uphill battle. I was the only one that hadn't raced single seaters before. I had never raced in Europe and I had to travel. I was the only one traveling to and from the States. Um, so, you know, it was, yeah, it was, it was hard, but I, I'm so, I'm so thankful for the opportunity because it's, it's molded me to become an even sharper driver. I, I have flashbacks to high school hockey and seeing my name on the, uh, on the, on the chalkboard there in the, in the training room. Uh, as you were saying all of that. Um, so we'll move, on, <laughs> so we'll move on slightly here. Um, actually, one of, uh, one of our longtime listeners and a big fan of yours down in Florida, uh, our buddy George, as we like to call him, was curious. 
your partnership with Bubba Burger is they, they seem one of your <laughs> more uh, active sponsors and we're all fans of cheeseburgers here. Uh, so how did, uh, you know, how did that come about and, and start to begin with? Yeah. So, um, George, first of all, thanks for, you know, writing in and, and, and supporting um, all of us that we really appreciate it. Um, and I like telling, like, I do actually, I'm very open about like my partnerships and, and, um, and how I obtained them, et cetera. Um, and, and I do, and I say, it and I do it because, you know, if it can help somebody, you know, a little bit in their process of search response, you know, searching for sponsors and partners, um, then great. So be it. So um, mine was a very long, drawn out uh, process with Bubba Burger. I had actually been essentially soliciting them for three and a half years before they actually became a partner of mine. Wow. Um, it started with, and this is this is where I think like a lot of people go wrong is they just they find like a company that is trendy and they think has a lot of money and so they're going to go after that right whereas i think that they should be people should be going after partners and companies that you know feel like a very like natural natural and authentic like way to um fit like their personal brand and for bubba burger for me it was a couple things um they're based out of jacksonville florida which i'm originally from and currently live in they sponsored the jacksonville jaguars which was um, our NFL team is, and is, is our NFL team. They have a parent sister company, um, Peter Brook chocolate. And I mean, oh, I love chocolate. Who doesn't? Um, and, and their burgers are delicious. And it's kind of like this all American brand. And I feel like the all American girl next door. And I, I still feel that way. So there were all these things that just made me feel like, like I should be representing this brand. Like I want to be partnered and affiliated with this company. So I started soliciting <laughs> and three and a half years later, um, they did some small like partnerships with me here and there. And I was in the office um, with them and I, I, I essentially said to them, I, I need you to either like, like, let's do it or let's move on. Because at this point, it's like, it's becoming, I'm questioning whether it's wasting my time. And um, they said, you know what, let's not, let's not waste any more time. Let's, let's partner up. And that's where they became um, significantly more involved in my career. And I owe, you know, I owe a lot to Bubba Burger. And I also owe a lot, you know, I have a very similar story actually with Lucas Oil yeah. and um, Lucas Oil products. That, that relationship started back. I, I always go to performance racing industry and it's such a good way for young drivers to go and get contacts and just like get their name established in the industry and just keep in touch with people. And with Lucas Oil, you know, it was the same deal. Like, you know, I met them at PRI and um, I kept in touch and they gave me free product and I had no sponsors in the beginning, no cash sponsors, except mom and dad putting in everything they could <laughs> and, and some friends. And um, I put their name huge on the car because I didn't want to look sponsorless. And I also didn't want to look like the rich kid that is sponsorless because they don't need the funding. You know, I, I, I need it. So um, because I did all of this, so much up front with like a Lucas oil when time, when push came to shove, I'm like, okay, come on, like, let's do something here. Um, they jumped in and they jumped in in a big way. And so like those two sponsors have been with me for a long time and have been a very successful partnership. I love it. Uh, thank you, George, for writing in there. Um, one thing I saw when I was looking up your bio was the Bonneville salt flats. You're in the drag racer with, uh, and I might mispronounce her name. Like I always do. Uh, okay. Cornac. Mueller Cornac. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, connected to you on a on a bike. Um, you know, what's what's the background behind that for maybe those who don't know? It, and how cool was that experience? Just reading about it, it sounds really cool. But uh, yeah, what, what think that experience like. Okay, so like definitely the raddest thing I've ever done. Um, it's, I don't know where to start. So the Pace Bicycle Land Speed Record is really unique in that it's a land speed record that is focused around a bicyclist um, based on human power. And the this is not a, a regular normal record. Um, as a matter of fact, it hadn't even been attempted since 1995 was the last time. And there's I can count on my hands and toes the number of people in history that have even attempted this record. And so essentially um, in order to break the law of physics of going more than like 
you know, 60 miles an hour on a pedal bike from, you know, uh, in a straight line, no elevation from start to stop, right? That's about like the cadence and the speed that, you know, right. professional cyclists go, right? So to break the law of physics, physics, you have to have a draft. And that's where I come into play. So I was the drafting vehicle, um, essentially, you know, breaking this hole um, and this so that Denise, um, the rider, uh, could ride in this uh, vortex that would allow her to achieve these just absolutely outrageous speeds on a bicycle. And the only place really to do this, it's very limited because you need pretty, you essentially need six miles of flat surface stretch with no <laughs> obstacles, right? Like there's not that many places where you can go and do this. But at the Bonneville Salt Flats, um, which is hugely popular for land speed records in the U.S., we decided to go do it there. Um, the salt brings a different, like, um, characteristic to all this because the salt changes. It's not like asphalt where you pretty much know, like, okay, for it's going to be good for five years, right? Like, it's pretty much not going to change. And the salt is always changing as, like, water levels rise and then the salt, and then it dries up. And sometimes the salt's good, sometimes it's shit. Um, you know, the first year we did this, um, the salt was, like, okay. The second, we, we set a women's record but that's not what we were there for we didn't right. break the overall record which was at the time in 1995 when it was last set was um oh gosh 167 miles an hour on a pedal bike <laughs> um so when we went back the second time um the salt condition i think i'm trying to recall i think it was actually better right so i think the salt condition was better we got a different car this time. We actually got a dragster and it was the exact dragster. We found it. It was a mothball in the back of this guy's shop. And it was the exact dragster, Lakester, they actually call it out there, that um, Fred Rompelberg, the, the previous record holder, um, used. So this thing needed a massive overhaul. Like if there was going to be a limiting factor, it was going to be the car, <laughs> like breaking down. It wasn't going right. to be Denise or I. So we um, we do a couple test runs, and 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 because of the cadence on the bike, like can you imagine going a hundred? Can you even imagine going a hundred miles an hour on a regular pedal bike? Like absolutely not, because your feet won't even be able to keep up with I, the yeah, I think twelve my legs gears. Would fall off. Yeah, like you couldn't even keep your feet on the pedals. So the gear ratio is like massive. It's like, you know, it, it's, I forget what it is. It's like a 60, you know, 40 gear ratio or something, right? So she can't physically um, pedal the bike from a stop. So she has to be connected to the back of the vehicle, which she was up until mile marker about one and a half. And then from one and a half all the way to mile marker number five, she was under her own power. Um, which is just insane because this dance and this tango between the bicyclist and the driver has to be so thorough and unique and special and you have to be on the same brave wave. And I mean, it's more than just your like raw talent and capabilities. It's got to be like this emotional, um, psychological, like I trust you, you trust me thing. And um, so, I mean, yeah, sure. Could anybody do what I did? Yeah. But could anybody do what I did without killing Denise? No. Um, so at mile marker four is where they actually clock the, the time, um, or excuse me, they clock the, the speed. And so for mile marker four to five, the average speed of that is what determines your record. And we were maxed out, topped out in the dragster as fast as it would go going 184 miles an hour for pretty much more for more than a mile which is absolutely which is like absolutely utterly insane okay to go to do that maxed out like for over a mile it was definitely putting Denise at this risk and then so as as I know like okay we've we've definitely done well here <laughs> okay what becomes really hard is actually catching her, stopping her. That's one of the most dangerous parts of all of this is now I have to, and she's no more than, you know, two feet off of the back bump bar, if you will, the back of the car. Um, if she goes further than two feet off the back of this car, she gets out of the vortex and potentially can get spit off the back. And if she's spit out the back going 180 miles an hour, 
she's likely not to, she will not be walking away from that. And she might not ever walk away from that. You know, it could sure. be her, the fall <laughs> to her death. So when I, when we catch her, um, what I mean by that is, is I have to very, very slowly, like it's so methodical. Like I have to watch, I'm watching a million things in the cockpit and out ahead of me because it's a mirage. You really can't kind of see where you're going and you've got to stay in the track. Um, because everything, it's like area 51 out there. And as I'm starting to slow down, I feel her hitting the bump bar when I, when she isn't hitting the bump bar anymore, I know she's up against it. And then I can aggressively start to slow down, but I can't slow down too fast to where she's actually going to potentially flip face first into the back of the vehicle. So it's a really, you know, it's, it's a really like gnarly thing to yeah. go through. And, and what made that day just so, I mean, so we shattered the record, right? From 167 to 184, we're the first, you know, women to ever attempt this. Um, and we set a record, but what made it even more cool for me was we are likely to be the only people in the world that day doing what we were doing. And like, there are not that many people that can say that like astronauts can say that like fighter right. jet pilots can <laughs> potentially say that like that for me, that's what makes it just the raddest thing I've ever done. It was so cool. Yeah. I, I loved reading about it. I forget where I read about it, but for those listening, uh, Google it. Everywhere. Cool Probably everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> it uh, was big. It was, we got a lot of publicity. Um, so you have, yeah, I know you mentioned it earlier. You have a quite a list of, uh, you know, partners that you work with, uh, and you're involved in a number of different kind of motorsports related businesses, you know, coaching brand develop, uh, some women in automotive type, uh, businesses. How do you, uh, stay so focused on all of the business end of things while developing your on track driving career? Well, you know, to be frank, I mean, the business comes first, um, sure. you know, without, without the business end of it, like you don't even get the opportunity to get out on the racetrack. Um, for me in a sick way, like I really get off on the business end of it. I enjoy it. If I didn't enjoy it as much as, as I do, I probably wouldn't have gotten as far as I've gotten to, to this point. Um, it excites me. I went to school for interpersonal and organizational communications and marketing. And I did that. I know that sounds so fancy, but if I say the whole <laughs> thing, it like, you know, it makes me sound smarter. Right. So um, of course. I do the same yeah, thing. Anyway. <laughs> um, so like, you know, I knew that I had some, I knew that I had natural street smart on the business angle. Um, but I needed to back that up with some book smarts and that gave me like a competitive advantage, especially at, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old. Whereas, you know, instead of having somebody draft proposals and finalize proposals and draft contracts and finalize contracts, like I was doing that. And when I look back at like my work, I mean, it was pathetic. Like it was, I don't, I mean, it, no wonder why I got so many no's. But that's the name of this game, and, it, and it's a numbers game. And you got it for every no, you're that much closer to a yes. And for every bit that you do business-wise for yourself, you learn throughout that process. Um, so I guess the reason why and how I stay so motivated to, to do, like, all of this and then on top of it still focus on my – training regimen to be a driver and then you know the engineering side and putting in the work like the simulator work and and putting in my notes and prepping for races um you know I think you just need when there's a will there's a way to do things um and I have like a very maverick mentality about me meaning like I do things I've been forced to do things very unorthodoxly and think like there is no box and um you know, maybe too, because my start in racing was really unconventional. Like I didn't, this wasn't a generational thing for me. And, you know, we didn't come from an affluent background. Um, but we were so naive, my family and I, when we got involved, it was actually a great blessing in disguise. Because if somebody told me like a uh, Lynn St. James, who, who isn't going to listen to her, um, <laughs> when she would tell me to do something, <laughs> I'm like, I would just be like, okay, yeah, like that's what I'll do. And I would do it. And somebody even like Lynn, who has actually become not just a great mentor, but a really great friend of mine. Um, she's like, she'll even say this to you. She's like, you're one of the only people that actually, when we provided you with tools, you actually went out and got it done. 
And that's where this maverick mentality, like be a doer, like if you say you're going to do something, do it. And I just kept going and going. And maybe it was some, some of it, me being naive, but that was great because I just, there was no like, what do you mean girls can't race? Like, you know, or, or what do you mean? Like, you know, just because I don't come from money, I can't do this. Like, what do you mean? Just because I don't know how to drive a manual doesn't mean I can be a race car driver. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I just, I'm like, cool, I'll just go learn and I'll get these things and, and we'll move on with it. And, um, and so I think because of some of that is why I am able to stay focused. Um, because, you know, back to this whole like girl next door thing, like, you know, I've had this great career so far and I've had all these amazing opportunities that without motorsports, I wouldn't be living this life. Um, but it, rem I have constant reminders of the humility in all of it because these fantastic opportunities that have come my way, they can go away much faster than they stay around. So you've got to just like have humility in what you do and just stay humble and hungry at it. Um, and I believe that all you really have to do is like every day, like be able to look at yourself in the mirror, make your mom, your dad, your significant other, um, your grandma, your grandpa, and then the people that you work for, whether it be an employer or a sponsor or your mechanic, make those people happy. Don't worry about everybody else. Just make those people happy. I love it. I think we have motivational quote number two here. That's like a Gary Vaynerchuk <laughs> motivational style quote in that one. Um, so you actually touched on one thing I, I wanted to to ask about, or two things, and I don't even know which one to ask first, so I'm just going to go in order here of, of what I wrote down. You actually started as a competitive water skier growing up and then learned to fly your dad's plane. Is there any form of adrenaline seeking that you haven't tried yet that you would like to? All right. Well, learning how to fly my dad's plane is like a loose term. I mean, I, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to, I, yes, yes. I like learned how to fly a little bit with my dad. I did some, um, you know, I put some hours in to go, go towards my, my license, but I never actually, I would never, I still to this day probably wouldn't actually feel that comfortable flying alone. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, you know, I, you know, I don't know, like there are definitely some bucket list items that I, I just think would be really cool to be involved in right now. I'm still very focused though in motorsports because that's where I've like built my brand and right. my businesses. Um, I think it would be really cool to branch out, um, you know, from a, from a driving perspective, I think it'd be really cool to branch out into some dirt stuff, maybe like some Baja stuff. Um, I haven't done much of sliding cars around, so, you know, maybe like learning just a little bit of drifting. I'm not sure that I actually want to take that to like a professional level, but maybe just to add some more like tools to my toolbox for maybe like some stunt driving stuff as I've just recently gotten into a little bit more of that non-SAG work, um, like actors work, but, uh, corporation work. Yeah. Um, so that would be, that would be really cool. Like I still want to stay behind the wheel, um, of anything and everything. Um, whether it's competitive or for building my brand, say like if I got into one day, maybe doing some broadcasting, right? Like I still want to be able to, or a TV personality. Like I yeah. still, I still want to be able to like sling a car around and know what I'm doing. Um, and, and then be, you know, more, maybe a voice for whatever the opportunity is as well. Cause I just, I enjoy the the marketability and the, the fun that comes out of, you know, programs and television, you know, that type of stuff. I, I just, I've always had a little bit of a knack for it and um, I'd like to, you know, maybe hone in my skills more, but, but uh, outside of that, I have like this one really stupid idea of, um, and, and I'm not even, I'm going to butcher all of this, but if you YouTube John Boat Racing, and it's skinny water stuff, very narrow, tight rivers, where there is a ballast person on the front of this very high-powered um, John boat. And then there is a John boat tiller driver. Um, my husband and I would be so rad at this because he can drive the crap out of any boat, like anything. I trust him to drive. And then I would actually be the ballast person in the front, like, 
with the helmet over the over the edge of this john boat going 60 miles an hour in this very backwoods twisty windy stuff and i mean if you mess up like you're you're going like you know you're like Den you're you're denise at the salt flats right <laughs> like you're if you mess it up like um that that's one thing i think would be really cool to at least attempt um and i'm watching of it that, on, you on youtube right now and uh <laughs> This is going through some like marshlands in Australia. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I, I will uh, I will put this link in the show description notes so everybody <laughs> can check it out because it's pretty ridiculous. Uh, it is ridiculous. You definitely won't find me doing something like that. Um, <laughs> although it looks a lot of fun. So moving on from that, you know, you're one of the more uh, fan friendly social media drivers out there in, in all of motorsports just how important is that to you know like you mentioned a couple of times building that overall Shea Holbrook brand yeah so um it's so important to me because you know so many of like my long-term fans have in a way like become friends like these are the people that you know I have a group of fans that come to like the mid Ohio or Laguna race every single year. And I expect to see them and they bring their kids and every year their kid gets a year older. And like, I know these people by, you know, their name. And um, I think it's really great to connect with people on that level. Um, but also to stay committed to like your job and, and know that, you know, you can't always give, you know, uh, you know, 30 minutes to every single person, but if you can just make, you know, one little impression on somebody because they've made an impression on you. That's a good give and take, right? Um, and it's so important in building a brand and, and, you know, getting people to not just support like you as a person and individual, but your career and your affiliates and sponsors on board. Um, and that aids in more success. And so as I'm becoming more successful, I feel like I need to pay even more you know, gratitude to the, to my supporters and fans that have helped me get there because, you know, especially in today's world of digital media, like it's so important to have, you know, a viewership and you don't have to have, I mean, of course, like the more followers you have, the, the, the better things are, Sure. but not always, like, not always is that completely accurate. And, you know, if I had, if I had a, just a mental, like, you know, t tick box that I could compute at the end of every night into a Word document of every, you know, every Bubba Burger coupon that I gave out or every, every person that I spoke to about a, a, a particular Lucas Oil product to use for their everything from their, yeah, your, your car to your gun. Like, um, you know, if I, if I had, if I had this mental tick box that I could compute into this spreadsheet, like it would show that I do actually a lot more that is more meaningful that's not a tangible thing than just social media and so I have to back both of these up and complement each other well um, they need to complement each other well and although I don't you know have you know a million followers you know let's just say Instagram I think I'm up to like getting close to like 16,000 those are all super authentic like I didn't buy them um, and my 16, you know, thousand followers on that one social account are like super active with me and like, I'm active with them and there's a really good give and take there. And I, I think that actually in a lot of ways, that's more to a sponsor than just having, than having 50,000, but all you do is just put your crap out there and you, and there's not, there's nothing to make the fan, you know, genuinely like go buy the products that you represent, et cetera, like really, really try to support you. Um, and, and, you know, that can be, a, that can be a tough, that can be a tough game because um, there's always somebody out there that's got more followers than you do. And, um, and, you know, you know, try to justify why, why you're the better, you know, you know, you know, vote on the ticket. Right. Yeah, for sure. I definitely know that feeling. Um, Great answer again. So we'll wrap it up with two questions here. Thanks so much for, for all your time this afternoon. Um, I believe I read somewhere a couple of weeks ago that you'd love to give, you know, the Indy 500 or IndyCar, uh, you know, that'd be a goal you'd like to achieve at some point. What do you think that, you know, you need to do uh, to get there? 
Yeah, I mean, if I was to stay in single seaters, um, and that was that to be my, you know, path completely solely moving forward, then obviously the 500 is like, you know, a massive, you know, checkbox ticket item. Um, to get there uh, is where we have to be like very realistic with ourselves, right? Like to get there, it would mean a, a lot of time, effort, and funding put towards single seaters. It would be you know, moving up the ranks to, um, you know, surpassing, you know, let's say Formula 3 Americas to Indy Pro to Indy Lights. And now there's a requirement, obviously, to do X amount of races and finish, you know, X above um, in an in Indy Lights program to qualify for your opportunity to get into an Indy car. Um, and then the relationship building. Um, I have a, a really great network of people in sports cars. Um, and not quite as many in the indie car circuit. Um, of course, I know like some drivers and some team sure. owners and some engineers. Um, but it would be a lot of it would be a lot of work, and it would definitely be a, a very much so uphill battle. Um, I think you. I don't think it's the reason why I even put it on my radar is because I don't think it's um, not a, a, that it's not doable. Um, but my my career path and the way that I think about that would have to change significantly um for and i think too like if i talk about it and say that i want to do it then maybe <laughs> like maybe some people will be like maybe you know just like we're talking about it now maybe it'll it'll turn the ears on to some people that i it's even potentially a goal set of mine um whereas if you don't talk about it then it, it's never an opportunity it, you know just because you know other people all, as well aren't um, view, viewing it as something you want to do or would like to do. For sure. Uh, and I will wrap it up with one easy question here, probably the easiest that, that we've asked in the interview. Uh, what is a little known Shea Holbrook fact that you are proud of? Oh, um, oh gosh, you said easy. Okay. Or maybe, um, maybe sneakily difficult. Um, yeah, it might be actually a little bit <laughs> difficult. Um, <laughs> That, that people don't, that people don't know. Okay. This is going to be super weird. This is probably, this is where I'm going to lose followers. Thanks. Mike. <laughs> um, so I have this very weird obsession with graveyards, um, not cemeteries because cemeteries in my opinion are the, the new old people, old, new dead people. Graveyards are like super dead people that have been in the ground for a really long time and their headstones are really old and decrepit and half broken. Um, I love that type of history and the history of it really probably means nothing other than like, I wonder what these people were like and I wonder yeah. like, you know, what they did. And as a matter of fact, like I've even thought as far in advance that I actually like I want to be cremated but I want a headstone but I want people at my funeral to like take hammers to this headstone and make it look weathered and then put it in a graveyard just because like, I think that's <laughs> just, a hilariously awesome idea um only because <laughs> about, incredibly weird <laughs> you know it's no no judgment coming from from me or either of my other hosts that'll probably be listening to this uh, because <laughs> last week I was walking around uh, my parents' house. They live next to a, a really old church, and uh, uh, my mom and I took my dog for a walk, and uh, we 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 did the same thing to see, you know, where we had our own competition of who can find the oldest gravestone there. So uh, yeah. I might lose some followers too, I guess. But you know, <laughs> I'm yeah. I'm totally okay. The dark side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I love horror yeah. movies and all that stuff, so it's right <laughs> up my alley. I know Jess will will appreciate that. Um, so with that being said, again, thank you so much for, for your time. Best of luck uh, going forward into the rest of 2019 and 2020. I know we'll all be uh, rooting for you no matter where you're racing. Uh, and where can people find you on social media? Yeah, so I'm pretty much on just about all of it. Um, on Instagram, which I use pretty regularly, it is Shea Holbrook. Um, Twitter, that I also use very regularly, it's under Shea Racing. And then my Facebook page under Shea Racing, Shea Holbrook. Um, yeah, I like to stay in contact with everybody and I, I find it, I'll, you know, I get great joy out of it as well. And then my um, my website is uh, Shea Racing, S-H-E-A Racing.com. 
Sounds good to me. Well, thank you very much again. Uh, good luck, and uh, I'm sure we'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, it's been super fun, Mike. Thanks for having me on. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. You too.